Okay. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am assuming, we, yes, we do have a few gentlemen in the participating. Um, welcome to our dialogue session. It's 3 p.m. now. Um, I see participants still coming in and being added. So I will allow for just maybe another two minutes while we add persons and then we can um, officially start. In participants and we have uh, two of two presenters. So I think we shall go ahead and I'm sure other persons will join as we proceed. So I'd like to officially welcome everybody to our dialogue series. This week we are looking at sustainable livelihoods, the environment, water, and imperatives around climate change. Cool. Um, I'm Indy McClymont Lafayette. I'll be back session. I am the Managing Director of Change Communications Limited and Change Works on development issues such as climate change, the environment, and gender. I've been working on climate change communication since 2005, um, where I started with Panos Caribbean. And currently, I consult on two climate change adaptation projects nationally and regionally. I'm very, very happy to have with us today two professional and outstanding ladies who will share their perspectives with us. That's Miss Eleanor Jones and Miss Anete Mills. And I will introduce them officially in very short order. But I just wanted to start with a few opening remarks just to put a bit of background and context on the table um, as we proceed. As we all know, COVID-19 has significantly affected all our lives since March. And this dialogue series emerged from, you know, a team of women and gender groups, some around the 51% coalition who really are concerned with how we recover um, from COVID. And so the idea came to have a series of, this series of dialogues so that we can look um, share information, be informed, and then look at possible solutions that we can put forward um, in our different spheres of influence. Um, so this series is looking at the way we re-emerge from the fallout of, fallouts of the last couple months. I mean, it's quite a double whammy that um, Jamaica is dealing with COVID as well as climate impact. And so while we have been pretty much dealing with COVID at the forefront of our minds that we Jamaica has been experiencing some climate impacts over the past few months as well and I just wanted to share um, a few of those things with you I mean we all see the Sahara dust currently impacting the island the second wave is predicted for next week going the weekend going into next week and that has implications for our temperatures and our disease burdens and so on. We are noting an increase in forest fires. The Jamaica Fire Brigade in a recent article, I think that was um, two months ago, reported the number of bushfires between, and the significant increase in the number of bushfires between January and March 2020 in, in comparison to the year before. So from, for the first three months of 2020, the Jamaica Fire Brigade recorded a total of 1,854 bushfires, which they said is a 15.8% increase 
above the 1,601 recorded for the same time in 2019. They also gave a comparative from 2016 to 2019, where the number of bushfires across the country increased from 3,716 to 5,838. And with the drought conditions that the island is currently experiencing, um, you know, we are particularly vulnerable. The drought forecast for the next three months from June to August showed that um, rainfall amounts are likely to be below normal to near normal. And of course, with above normal temperatures and we're all feeling the heat. Those of us who have AC may have it a little better, but um, we're, we're feeling that impact. We know also that insufficient rainfall in the recent months has resulted in drier conditions for most parishes. And finally, just to mention the hurricane season, which started um, June 1 and is predicted to be above average. So that's something that we have to really keep an eye on. So it's, it's just some background, some food for thought, you know, that what we're facing, what we're looking at and why this dialogue is so critical for us to really um, share and talk and see um, practical approaches for how we can move forward. So with that mouthful out of the way, I would like to um, proceed to go to our speakers. And for this session, I will start with Ms. Eleanor Jones, um, who will make her remarks. Then we will have 10 minutes for questions, following which Ms. Mills will speak, and then we will open for a general discussion on the issues raised. So allow me to introduce uh, somebody who I've worked with for so many years. Can't even remember how long now. Uh, Ms. Eleanor Jones is an environmental risk management and development professional with significant international experience in the fields of environment, social safeguards, disaster risk management, climate resilience building, and sustainable development. She has moved from academia at the University of the West Indies to pioneering enterprise and awareness of environmental risk management as good business in Jamaica. She's worked regionally and internationally. She's a chairman, our chairwoman, and CEO <laughs> of Environmental Solutions Limited, um, a private sector environmental engineering and management services company. She has served on several boards, both locally and internationally, and is well recognized for her work in environmental risk management systems, as well as with civil society. In 2018, she was conferred with the Government of Jamaica's honor of the Order of Distinction in the rank of officer. And this was for her contribution to the development of environmental management and civic development. She was also the recipient of the 2017 Bronze Musgrave Medal from the Institute of Jamaica for Distinction in the Field of Science. And so, Eleanor, we happily await your remarks at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm going to, now that you see who I am, everybody, I'm going to come off the, um, the video to um, optimize our bandwidth. You know, we have all of these challenges. It's a, it's a pleasure uh, to be with you all. Thank you for the introduction, India. And indeed, we have been working together for a, a, a long time. And here we are, we, we sort of keep coming together to, to spread the word, to, to preach and teach, as I, as I indicated um, to you earlier. But here we are in this um, very, very difficult time. Um, we are in crisis. Humanity is in crisis. Nature is in crisis. Um, here in Jamaica, we are in crisis. Our people are in crisis. Um, it's, it's a very serious thing. And as Indy has started by saying, we, we've been grappling. We started 2020 with a lot of enthusiasm. I know I certainly did thinking we're going to be racing to 2030. We have a decade to perform, to reach the goals, to get as close to the goals as possible. And then bam, we get hit with this 
COVID-19, which has changed so many things. It has really stripped away our vulnerabilities as people. I think it has brought us all across the world to our knees because it has been truly a leveler. And we have to really think what, what exactly is happening here. Um, we, we, we heard persons, many um, opinions being given, oh, nature is, nature is striking back. Um, you know, it's, it, it is, it's telling us that we're just moving too fast and we need to slow down, we need to clean. And so we heard anecdotal evidence and some also scientific uh, validation that we had um, less pollution in, in many areas. Here in Jamaica, we, you know, skies were cleaner, you heard more birds, whether we had more birds, but you could hear them because there was less traffic. We didn't have the noise. Um, we heard about water being, you know, cleaner water and, and all these kinds of things which, which spoke well to the future. And then, um, you know, saying, well, if only we could keep this, how can we recover and still maintain uh, redu reduced pollution, reduced emissions, um, trying to get our, our wildlife back and, and so on. And then along comes this, this plume of, of Sahara dust, which we're, we're told is, is probably the worst in 50 years and, and bringing new levels of, of pollution. So we are back to an exaggerated form of air pollution here, far more than, than we, we, we would have anticipated. And then that comes also on top of the, the protracted drought, which we have been having, that Indy also referred to, the high temperatures and the Sahara plume has aggravated those temperatures. So um, we were also worrying, there was a great deal of anxiety about the hurricane season, which, which we heard was going to be hyperactive, above normal. The other side to that is, of course, with the Sahara dust, we're told that we perhaps won't have a hyperactive season, but maybe an active season. So we're downgrading. And then there is more thinking that this, the dust is going to further suppress the formation of hurricanes. So with the good and the bad, but what does it tell us? It tells us that nature really, the natural systems, natural systems function with or without us. I think we have some background, some mics that maybe need to be muted. Um, natural systems function with or without us or function and that we need to pay particular attention. One of the um, shortcomings or unfortunate things is that we tend to kind of, when, when we mention the word environment, um, it is usually sort of dismissed or shunted aside as perhaps not as important as getting back the jobs, not as important as getting the protective gear for the health workers, not as important. But what we, what we have failed to recognize, and perhaps for those of us who have been in that practice, we, we haven't been able to perhaps reach um, our citizens, our decision makers, our policy makers in the way that, that we need to, for them to really begin to understand that we're talking about life support systems. We're not talking simply about esoteric things. Let's just clean up the garbage and let's just plant a few trees and, and let's just have, you know, do um, presentations. Let's just go and get an EIA and get a permit to do what we want to do. Well, regrettably, there are many who feel that when you speak environment, you're speaking of EIAs. Um, the truth is you cannot manage the environment through, through EIAs. And, and it is just so much more than that. And we need to begin to somehow understand that when we speak of environment, we're speaking of the natural environment and very importantly, the built environment. And it is the built environment that we have to be concerned with as we, we, we have this dialogue today because the natural systems regulate themselves and we see what's happening. We, 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 we see um, that human intervention in these natural systems have, uh, has created 
some of the disruptions that that have occurred. So one of the things that that COVID has revealed to us is that human behavior is is really perhaps at the center of this because we're talking about environmental health conditions and the scientists are telling us that the more we destroy our natural habitats and displace the animal kingdom and and get closer to them is the greater the, the chances of of our of these some of these diseases moving from the animal kingdom to 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 humans and we we're going to get the pandemic that we have now, and we're going to get more of them as, as we go. Um, we also know, again, related to, um, to natural systems, the disruption or disruption is what has caused changing climatic patterns so that all of the extremes and the variability and the things that we're seeing now that we never saw before um, have come about because we have been very disruptive and we, we, the science that, that we need to use to guide our thinking, um, we, have, we, have, we, have pushed, we have pushed aside. And so this year's um, environment theme, World Environment Day, was time for nature, time for us to come back to recognize that the air we breathe, and we're seeing it here with the Sahara dust, we're seeing it with the heat, the food we eat, um, drought conditions, inadequate water, farmers are suffering. Sometimes with these climate disruptions, we have flooding. And, and so generally, we have created this tremendous disorder. This, this, this disorder with, with climate and climate in turn um, causing problems for us, which I don't believe that we really have fully accepted and recognized even as we struggle with trying to recover and trying to bring back business in, in our society. Um, and that being said, I want to just at this point say that we have been fortunate, I think, in Jamaica in being able to control the incidence of, of, um, of disease. And I just now, I don't know how many of you have received this or seen this notice that within the past 24 hours, Florida has had a 9,000 case incident, which is, which is, which is amazing. It, 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 it's frightening. And it's frightening because um, the, the, the Florida is one and you have some other states, but that is a, a, a weight on their system. And the more um, exposed, the more vulnerable, the more serious the situation is in the United States, is the more exposed we are here also in Jamaica as we're trying to get back um, to, to pre-COVID um, or living with COVID as it is. So we, we have to, to give thanks that we have had the kind of leadership in our public health, in our environmental health or public health, let's say, where our health workers, our leadership has, has helped us, um, helped us to contain. And um, I think we have done extremely well and we have a lot to be proud of when we, we look around and, and, and particularly when we, we look north, which was the, the leader and we have always looked to the United States as having all the answers and doing all the right things. Here we are in Jamaica where we have managed to do this. So if we have managed to put in place the systems to provide the leadership, to provide the resources, which we know are, are rare, we need to begin to look at how we can use the same form of risk management, the same form of risk control. We activated the Disaster Risk Management Act to control environmental health. Um, people are saying we need to take the same approach to controlling crime. And I think we need to, to use that risk management approach to looking at how we integrate our environmental considerations into the recovery process so that we, play, we ensure that our climate change adaptation, where we put the measures, measures in place to, to uh, increase our coping capacity for the uh, climate impacts, 
um, and that we also uh, put in place the mitigation measures, particularly moving towards low carbon, um, trying to build our energy resilience as much as our climate resilience, that we, we need to take on board the fact that we can't, we can't control natural systems, but we certainly can manage the way that we, we interact with natural systems and manage the way that we respond to what these natural systems do. And, and so that as, as we go forward, um, I would like to suggest that we start to think of um, our air quality, what we can do ourselves for managing air, if we can, if we can work towards building, or making our urban areas cleaner, less burning, less fewer emissions, how we deal with our automobiles, the transportation. That's something, it, it, it can't happen magically, but we need to begin to think about these things. And of course, our indoor air quality as well. Um, in our offices, perhaps more than our homes, and depending on the kind of enterprise with which we are engaged, we need to, what are we doing? Are we, are we controlling our pollutants, um, because at the end of the day, we are looking at, at health. And I think environmental health is an overarching consideration for us as we step out of this, of this. health for our population, as well as health for our environmental assets. And then the other thing that's very important is the business of water, sustainable water supply. We, we prolong drought, we're going to see we know that climate change is bringing about unpredictability in our in our rainfall we're getting longer drought periods and when we do get rain sometimes the rain so occurs that we have massive flooding and so on and then at the end of the day if we don't have enough water um portable water we we can't you know we can't um have good sanitation and good sanitation is extremely important for our health. We don't have water for agriculture where we are compromising our food security. So we have to look at, again, what we're doing in terms of what influence can we have as individuals and in our own circles for controlling pollution in, in waterways, pollution in groundwater, as well and then conserving water so that we don't waste and we have water conservation has to become part and parcel of, of, of our daily lives and then water capture so we are talking more about rainwater harvesting and storage this is something that has to happen um, on, a, on an individual scale but really on a national scale and then of course our management of land or watersheds uh, this is something that we've been preaching for decades and we continue to deforest. We have some reforestation on the one hand and then we deforest on the other hand. And that's absolutely critical for biodiversity, for sustainable water, for controlling floods, for protecting soils. Really what I'm saying is, or I'm alluding to the fact that we're talking about systems that are so interconnected. Again, as we're coming out of this and what should we be thinking about? Our human settlements, our living conditions, um, for us to avoid um, the spread of disease, we, we have to look at how we, how we begin to upgrade some of the communities that are, are really in squalor uh, with inadequate sanitation, and it's, it's not about pointing fingers or talking about what should be done. I think all of us, each of us in our own small corner, we, we, we have to look at how we can influence this change because living conditions, poverty is, 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 is something that makes it even more difficult for us to cope with some of these changes that, that we are seeing. So we're also hearing that that dengue, again, which is another vector-borne disease, and, and these vectors um, with, with climate change, again, breeding patterns are changing. And so can you imagine 
coping with COVID, coping with mosquito-borne disease, um, looking at the possibility of having, again, water lock-offs, water shortages. And in some places, particularly in the rural areas, they, they just don't have adequate water supply so capture and distribution becomes critical and then if we were to ever god forbid have have a hurricane come upon us where where are the resources um that that we would have to 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 recover so again in 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 going forward we have to think of the potential um you only need one hurricane you know to to create a problem as we saw in the case of the Bahamas last year. So although they're saying, okay, maybe with the Sahara dust, you might suppress the number and we all get scared. We have to look at, at protecting, making sure that we, we safe, make our homes more safe or more resilient, check the roofs, check um, our, our, our system, anything in the house that might be vulnerable so that we, we minimize the impact on our individual living space and on our workspace as well. So we have to begin to think. So it's a lot for us to chew on, really, um, and a lot that, that we need to do. But at the end of the day, we can do it. We have to take science seriously. We have to understand that what is happening uh, listen to the scientists. It's, it's happening around us. Our environmental systems are raging and we are interfacing with them in some instances we're making them worse we're, we're we're disrupting them disrupting the steady state and that that balance um and then we 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 have to take tough decisions perhaps and and consider decisions in our personal lives and try to lobby to get our decision makers to to pay attention to the fact that at the end of the day, any development that you're talking about is all about people. People are at the center of it. So if we open up our borders and we bring back in our tourism sector because we have to provide jobs, that's very important because obviously we can't live without money. But as we're doing that, we, we have to think of maybe diversifying our tourism product and, and ensuring that we protect these wonderful environmental, these natural assets which we have. Jamaica is full of these natural assets that are beautiful, that need to be protected, but and in such a way that they can become um, attractive and health-giving and health-restoring to our own population as well as to our visitors. So we should begin to think of, of health tourism, not only for people to come in to be treated medically, but for them to come in for the therapeutic value of the, the natural assets and the natural beauty that, that we have. Um, so it's, it's, it's about protecting our land, it's about protecting our water, our marine space, our coastal areas. And we really, at the end of the day, we need a sea change. Um, we can't do everything immediately, but we need a sea change in our thinking so that we've, we've got to bring environmental considerations, which include changing climate, climate impacts, which include, and the climate impacts, of course, as, as you have heard, relate to the air we breathe, the water that we, we drink, the food that we eat. And, and, and the other aspects of the built environment, how we manage our waste, how we, how we manage our drainage, all of these, how we build, where we build, um, are we serious about having, you know, trees be the lungs, are we providing enough lungs within our urban centers to keep our air relatively clean for the health of our population? All of these things we we ought to be to be thinking about, and and again, as maybe I just complete here by saying, just looking at applying the environmental risk management approach as we approach as we proceed in this recovery phase, and the environmental risk management approach, of course, includes issues related to weather and climate, air, land, 
and water. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Eleanor. Um, yes, quite a bit for us to digest and start thinking through. And I would like to open the discussion um, to get comments, feedback on what you said um, just now. I would like to ask persons to just um, introduce themselves and then go into their comment or question. Hi, Indy and Elena. Good afternoon. Um, it's Hi. Emma Lewis here. How are you? Very well, good. Emma. How are you? Good, good. <laughs> Surviving. Um, mm -hmm. I had a quick question, um, which always is at the back of my mind. What do you think the importance and the role of uh, biodiversity is? It often gets shoved on the back burner and um, people think, oh, well, it's just a few birds and plants and like that. I, I wondered if you had a, an idea of how that fits into the picture for us as humans, both in particular in the um, rural areas, obviously, but and in tourism. How, how do you think that can work? How do we need to get through to people the importance of biodiversity? Because well, that's, a, that's a, as you say, getting through to people and, and maybe yeah. we have some other scientists on the, our, among our participants who can probably speak more strongly to it. But if, if we go back to the idea, uh, which is a difficult one for persons to understand that, that we're talking about systems that are interrelated. Mm -hmm. And so your biodiversity um, really relates to the the, the, the the interrelationship, if you will, among different types of life, um, whether you're talking about vegetation or you're talking about animals, so animals and plants, flora and fauna, um, all have a role to play and they, and they play that role together. And of course, biodiversity also um, is extremely important to us as we begin to look at at how we, we develop nutraceuticals. Um, so many of, the, uh, of our um, medicines and, and so on, and, and, and now that we're paying a lot more attention to health and natural health, um, biodiversity plays an extremely important role there. So um, that's, that's kind of a surface um, description, but getting it, it's, it's difficult for people to understand because we, 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 we as citizens, unless you're a scientist yourself, as ge a general citizens, you want to see and feel and, 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 and um, experience. So they can probably experience something that you can describe to them in terms of flood or in terms of some of the physical systems. But the biological systems are a um, little bit more difficult. People, um, again, the average citizen might be able to latch on and understand the relationship between um, um, in the biodiversity of, of your coastal resources and the, the interrelationship between um, you know, your coastal ecosystems and how, how the different parts um, relate to each other, how your beaches relate to your coral reefs and how your mangroves and your seagrass relate to the protection of beaches. So I, th I think that we have to begin to perhaps look at some practical linkages and applications to 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 demonstrate yes. and then, and then if yeah. we can get persons to to accept that then we can move into to why bird life is important why our butterflies are important you know how how they how they relate to other species and so on um, thanks a lot for that eleanor i just wanted to add a couple of things um to what you were saying from working in climate change, one of the, I am aware, I've participated in several awareness raising efforts with different partners like the Global Environmental Facility, um, GOG and so on, to raise awareness of the importance of, of biodiversity, especially when it comes to climate change adaptation. 
one of the things that we worked on was just preservation of the mangroves. And I was surprised to find out when I was working on that campaign how the critical role that mangroves play, for example, for you know breeding baby fish, protecting our shorelines, and so on. Um, and and that has implications too for livelihoods. You know, the fishermen, if the mangroves are not there to to help with the breeding of the fish, we will see the more decline in the fish stock down down the line. So a lot of interlinkages. And one thing that I am aware of, I know that IUCN has been working on a protocol, the Nagoya Protocol which they have been consulting with Caribbean countries about that specifically using biodiversity, um, getting it registered. So for example, our maroons who have so many natural healing herbal remedies, um, you know, when they partner with the pharmaceutical companies or when the companies come in, use their knowledge and then develop drugs, how do they benefit? So the Nagoya Protocol is looking at protecting um, vulnerable groups, um, you know, indigenous people's knowledge of our biodiversity or herbs and so on, and helping them to channel some of that knowledge into um, alternative livelihoods. So that's something that we can also look at a bit more closely for the, the Caribbean. Um, I see Ingrid Parchment here as well. I, I know Ingrid has done quite a bit of work yes. on biodiversity. So I, if Ingrid, if you want to come in, feel free to jump in at any point. Or Thank you for having me in um, Really, today I'm, I'm really just listening. I mean, I think, you know, it's interesting how something external to us and so unexpected has changed all our lives. And I think, you know, how it is that we interact, even my awareness of what is going on on the ground has had to change because I'm not able to be there and to be having that interaction with a lot of rural people who do not have the level of access that people think that we all have. You know, I mean, I'm executive director and my internet has not been working for months. I'm always borrowing from someone to use their internet or using my phone. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's interesting when you talk about um, what's happening with biodiversity. One of the things we do know is that as our conservation officers are out there doing their patrols. We have more people that are going into the sanctuaries because the weather has been questionable, say, since December. So going out further for fishers is more difficult. And I think they assume that because of COVID, we wouldn't be doing the level of patrol. But we've been doing that and we, you know, so we're trying to work with persons in terms of the issues that they have. But the idea of um, monitoring and, and maintaining a sanctuary is that you want them to have the the impact of the spillover effect as the fish move outside of the sanctuary to, to improve. So there are lots of things that are happening. We notice that there are lots of crocodiles as well that are coming up as always. You know, we saw um, uh, flamingos um, just a little south of Old Harbor Bay, which I don't think we had recorded that in a very long time. Um, you know, the guys send me photographs and videos of what they see. We have seen a lot of um, sargassum and that started fairly early because that started perhaps in April which I think for this year is much earlier than we normally see and that tells us that there are also other things so there's lots of positive and lots of negative and we continue to do the work I'm really very appreciative of this opportunity to share space with so many um, persons who are out there and you know concerned about what is happening I'm also very um, uh, pleased. I think there is a new awareness about the importance and value of conserving the environment, but allowing for those persons who need to rely on natural resources for their livelihoods. So I feel very positive going forward, even with all of the challenges that we have in cockpit country and that we have had in Goat Island, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think a positive mental space is where we need to kind of put ourselves to go forward and feel the positive impacts. I love that, Ingrid, very, very much, because one of the things that I would like us to think about when we, after a native presents, is just that, you know, what are some of the positive things or actions that we can take, the takeaways from this dialogue that we can go out and work on and implement. Um, part of what um, this dialogue has been doing, some of the women who, and gender groups who've been working, are, 
are on um, COVID, what you call it now, recovery committees for want of a better phrase. And so, you know, being able to come up with practical solutions that they can forward to the government on these committees for implementation is also important. So this is, is not this is not just another talk shop where we come and we share and we dialogue, but we actually want to leave with things that we can incorporate within our workspace as well as at the government policy level. So I'm just putting that there. Um, I would love to explore that more when we come back to the, the broader discussion. Um, any other comments um, from Eleanor's um, remarks? Yeah, hi, Indy and everybody. It's Carol. Hi, Carol. Hey. Um, so a lot of the a lot of the pushback that one gets um, in the sort of national conversation about environment and development um, and sustainable development and so on. A lot of the pushback um, focuses on people's needs for jobs and how those jobs are being satisfied by the the models that we have known up till now, right? And the big question then becomes, well, two things get posed. One is, are you anti-development when you talk about environment? And two, the other is, well, if we, if, we, if we have to give up some ways of doing, of making a living and, and employment, what do you suggest are the alternatives, right? So there's a sense that if we don't, we don't do things the way we've always done them, that there is no alternative that is sustainable and lucrative. So if in the presentations, um, I'd love to, for us as we go on to explore, what are some of the livelihood opportunities? Here we are in COVID, lots of people have lost some of those traditional jobs. It's very clear that many of the ways we used to, to earn a living may not come back or we'll have to come back ex very differently. So what are some of the opportunities um, within the context of, uh, as, as Eleanor phrased it, an, en an environment risk management framework and a sustainable framework? What would some of those opportunities be and in what sectors? Um, okay, that's a heavy question. Eleanor, you're on this spot if you want to share any thoughts. Um, yeah, and it might come out as we go along. I, I wasn't really necessarily just asking for a one answer. It's just a, for us to frame yes. how we... And, and, and for us to think about it, because the point yeah. that Carol is making is, is a very valid one, and it's something that you get all the time. If you tell me that I, I am burning, the, the clearing the hillside, and I'm accustomed to that. And when you talk to the farmers, because you, you begin by trying to understand where they are, what is their thinking process? And they tell you, well, when we burn it, the grass comes back greener and it's better for our, our animals, right? Now, how do you fight that? You have to fight that by, by being able to say to them, well, you, 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 you should, you ought not to burn because when you burn, you destroy X, Y, and Z. Why don't we try it this way, where you have selective clearing and, 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 and planting and, and rotating so that you get better yields and so on. So you have to provide alternatives. The same thing happened with, um, with, with fisher folk. I remember, I think it was Nick Grill many, many years ago when they introduced new, they started growing um, sponges there and they were, growing different types of, of, of um, marine life, um, getting the fisher, fisher folk to, or the fisher, fishermen to, um, to produce these things because they wanted to take them off the reef to try to allow some of the, the, the fisheries to, to restore themselves. So you can't say stop fishing and what you're bringing is too small and you, because then they tell you, well, you know, I have to live. Then you had, I remember we were working in Kingston Harbor and, and, the, and the fishermen there said, well, we have to do, we have to take the undersized sprat. We have to go in the channel because we don't know how to go outside of the harbor. We don't have the skill to go out there. So 
you have to again begin to retool and and help them you know to train and help them to to understand by providing the alternatives that's very important you you cannot say thou shalt not do because they have to live so we have to begin to look at you know what are what are some of those alternatives and we don't have the magic answer but we need to think about it um just a couple of thoughts as well. One of the projects that I work with, the adaptation program and financing mechanism uh, of the pilot program for climate resilience, uh, they, it's a $19 million US dollar project, which is in its um, almost final year. But one of the things that it has done is explore um, alternative options for farmers. So for example, in Upper Clarendon, they've put in five aquaponics systems in some of the rural communities. And this is a, a community effort. I mean, they've been working with the communities to train them on aquaponics because that, that is a new model that's being looked at, a more climate smart um, approach to farming where the crops are the turnover is quicker and you're not as exposed to the elements. And so far, the community is really responding quite well to that. They're just starting to market some of the crops from that. So I think that there are some government initiatives that are looking at how we, we um, divert from some of the traditional, well, um, traditional livelihood rules, especially because of how um, climate change is impacting them. Another project that also I found interesting, two actually, there's one on oyster farming, because we know that the fishermen have to be going further and so on to get some experimentation to see whether, you know, some of the fishermen can transition to oyster for farming as an alternative to fishing or, you know, to assist with income generation. So there's some of that. Um, there's a case of White River where they have a protected area to get fish back, but they have also helped some of the fishermen to transition into coral gardeners where they plant and protect the reefs, you know, and they got funding to help um, do the retooling and training of the fishermen. So there are some alternate options that are coming on board. A part of it is the sustainability in terms of having more broad scale training for some of these alternate livelihoods um, and then being able to sustain that in a significant way. So just another, some options being put on the table. Um, I will ask that we just hold comments and questions for the moment so that Ms. Mills can make her her remarks and then we will open up fully for discussion for the um, rest of the time. So I would, I'm happy to introduce Anaite Mills. She has over nine years of experience working in international development, consulting with organizations such as the Inter-American Inter -American Development Bank, the World Resources Institute and for governments in Latin America and the Caribbean. Before joining the IDB, she worked in the public sector in Guatemala City. Um, she worked on areas such as energy and agricultural sectors, um, looking at policy analysis and multi-stakeholder engagement. While at IDB, she worked on for the energy and climate change sector divisions covering Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, Belize, Barbados, Ghana, among others. Um, she, providing research, technical, and project support focusing on climate resilience and low carbon development. Currently, she is the she serves as consultant advisor at the Office of the Prime Minister, where she provides input on climate finance, transparency, and resiliency, as well as high level coordination support for international climate events and engagement with international climate funds working closely with the Climate Change Division. With that said, I open the floor. Anaiti, could you share your um, presentation with us, please? Yes, sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we're right hearing yes. you. All right, so I'm, I'm going to try to, to um, go through, well, it's, it's five slides, and, and mostly I'm, I'm gonna use them just as reference 
uh, as a follow-up to, to what uh, Eleanor has, has already very eloquently presented on the environmental protect, uh, protection side. And, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to, to share this platform. This is an important platform. I think this is the, absolutely the perfect time for community organizations, for the civil society, and, and for, for the public to be very vocal about and have an active role in influencing what's going to happen next. Um, so thank you so much for this invitation. I'm very honored to be here and I'm very honored to, to be sharing panel or discussion with Eleanor, who I consider uh, an environmental ambassador. And so it's very difficult to come uh, um, right after her. Uh, but I'm, I'm happy that she pointed out a, a, a couple of really interesting things. So hi, Eleanor, happy, happy to see you, my friend. And, and so, so let me jump right on it and, and let me go quickly through it so we can continue uh, uh, the rich discussion that we were having. And I'm happy that, that Eleanor uh, touched on these very different aspects of environmental protection and critical priorities that uh, sectors that will need a response in moving forward uh, and, and that need to be influenced with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, sustainable development in mind, with resilience in mind, and also with, with long-term sustainability. But just to give you, again, a, a context in, in the context in which we are operating in Jamaica and in many countries in the Caribbean is a context that, that I call and that I have heard uh, Dr. Clark in the Ministry of Finance call is the triple jeopardy. And the triple jeopardy is what we know is the high debt. We are high indebted countries. Although the, the debt in Jamaica has been steadily decreasing in the last couple of years, our economic future, especially now with the pandemic, is critically and very uncertain. Then we have the second jeopardy, the COVID-19 pandemic. We are lucky to be in a country that it's been, you know, managing the situation, you know, way better than many other countries. Uh, but we're still in the in the midst of it. This is not gone yet. We still have to be very vigilant about, you know, how we respond to to the government's, uh, you know, measures and 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 how we take care of ourselves and others. So we have the economic impact that we don't know yet, or we are starting to understand, that comes from the COVID-19 pandemic. What's going to be the cost? of all of this. How is this going to impact our life in moving forward? And, and we have seen, you know, timely social relief and economic stimulus planning, and we are still seeing some movements and start seeing some movements, but we have to remain very vigilant. And then we have the third jeopardy, which is climate change. We have seen that despite all the all what's happening, climate change is not stopping. The hurricane season is right on time. Uh, the, you know, the Sahara a dust plume that we saw, even though it's not related to climate change, tells us that you know nature continues its course, and things can still happen. Crisis can still develop, and things can still you know came up. So the economic losses that we can that we will experience continuously experiencing from climate change is still uncertain. So we're still in that kind of context. If we can move to we can move to the next one. So. I want to just go through through the through the steps of what happens, right? So we have the response, the deal with the issues of today. You know, our government, um, you know, was you know, I, I I find it almost a miracle that the Jamaican government was able to pull out resources to for social relief despite the debt that we have been uh, experiencing and the economic crisis that we have and, and the economic challenges that we're coming from. It's still, you know, there was crisis management in place and there was social relief, even though it was not enough, uh, it's not enough and it might be, you know, it more might be needed, but at least there was something in place. There was, uh, there was a social relief from the care program for path beneficiaries. There was, uh, uh, you know, uh, cash transfers that were able to, to be put in place and, and part of the contingency uh, allocations of the national budget. 
then you know do and thanks to the discipline of the Jamaican uh, of the Jamaican government and also at the country by extension we were able as a government to apply to the uh, International Monetary Fund to get some policy response not all the countries were able or were granted approved to access this rapid financing financing instrument jamaica was approved jamaica got 120 million us dollars and that injected liquidity into our financial system our fiscal reserves and that generated fiscal space for other projects and other things to continue its course because even though we are dealing with a pandemic we cannot stop you know what we are dealing with and many uh, ministries and agencies are already experiencing cuts in budget that are going to have uh, very um, concerning impacts on on the response of other aspects of our social and economic and and our you know development uh, in moving forward so that's something to keep in mind then there's tax policy that has been already put in place some tax stimulus, uh, we have seen some reductions on, on the income tax, uh, then a 10 billion COVID-19 fiscal contingency that is placed. Let's, re you know, let's remember that this is all playing with budget, reallocating a lot of resources, using resources from maybe other projects to reallocate so the government can effectively respond to the to the to the crisis this is what all, all, all countries are doing some you know with far more success with more research and more savings and some others not even able to so these are measures that are meant to be timely targeted and temporary and then we move on to recovery how do we heal an economic crisis how do we move how, we, how do we start to look and, and find the light at the end of the tunnel? So we know that the government here uh, has established an economic, a COVID-19 economic recovery task force uh, that is comprised with private and public sector representatives, and they have to come up with a set of recommendations on critical sectors um, that will help jumpstart the economy. This is something that we have to pay a lot of attention to. Uh, we haven't seen still the, the, the report, and we're going to see it and maybe see it bits and, uh, bits and, and pieces of it as, as, the, as, um, as, the, as the days go by. But you know, we have key sectors, we have transport, we have agriculture, we have energy, water, industry, just what Eleanor was describing, and what is going to come out of this economic response uh, if we are to, to ensure that Jamaica moves on into a sustainable, resilient, uh, economically diverse and independent to, the, to, uh, as to, to, to an extent we have to take a look on how those responses are going to be accompanied with the right policy shift and also with the market you know market oriented policies and measures that will be necessary if we are going to you know create more jobs uh, we might need to to increase innovation and development of technologies. We need to retool our people. We need to uh, invest more in education, and we need to see how this education is going to to develop and move and innovate and and be able to to live up to the expectations of this new normal that we're stepping into. And then there's collective action. On, on attracting investment, we need to, you know, be more, you know, uh, review uh, businesses and, and and rethink value chains, uh, rethink where are the opportunities, how can we change the way we do business, and boost resilience with the the thinking in mind that whatever we do in moving forward has to be very go, uh, go in hand with resilience, with risk management, like Eleanor was saying, and, and with a, an adaptive you know, mentality in mind. And most importantly, as we know that we're still dealing with climate change and we're gonna still be dealing with climate change, these recovery packages that come out from any task force or any group that is you know, working on that 
have to be aligned or have to have uh, have to be aligned with national development plans with vision 2030 have to be aligned with our own climate targets under the Paris agreement if we want to increase renewable energy we want to increase energy efficiency how or which policies need to be shifted now as a, as a response to the COVID-19 recovery that will help in propel and accelerate that transition. Um, so that is something to, to really um, uh, keep in mind and put a lot of attention into. And if we can go to uh, almost the last one is rebuilding and thinking long term. So how is how all of these pieces of the puzzle are going to be, you know, fit together? Uh, how is our government going to use public finance wisely in promoting green private finance and secure long-term commitments to low carbon alternatives? We were talking about renewable energy. We need to be dependent. We need to be energy dependent. We saw the crash on, on the oil market, uh, like on top of all of the things that were happening, oil also you know the market also crashed and what does that mean we cannot be dependent on oil we as as islands we really need to accelerate the transition to clean energy and sustainable transport sustainable agriculture and and, and rethink and innovate on our on agriculture and 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 also invest in resilient infrastructure because climate change and disasters may continue happening but how are we going to be able to come out of all these crises stronger. And that means that the investment for resiliency has to happen today. And that can generate jobs, you know. Uh, if you are, if, if the government is going to invest on, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, fixing roads or fixing bridges or, or um, you know, building seawalls or whatever is necessary, it has to be resilient, it has to be durable and sustainable, and that generates jobs. Um, Nature-based solutions can generate jobs. Uh, protecting the environment can generate jobs. But I do agree with Eleanor that there's a disconnection and this uh, perceived, um, you know, perceived lack of interest in environment, like it's, it, there's no value there. And there's a lot of value in protecting the environment and working in resiliency and generating uh, jobs. Um, we have to, to look for strategic partnerships at this point in time. Everybody who's just, uh, working in different aspects on different uh, businesses or sectors have to cross-pollinate and look for those uh, opportunities and those discussion uh, you know, and forget about the silo approach. We need to be sitting with the energy people. We need to be sitting with the finance people. We need to be sitting, as just as we're doing today, with, with gender ad advocates and, 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 and communities. We have to really create those spaces in which these conversations are not just kept in the group of, of, of people that, you know, kind of preaching to ourselves, but we really need to move the message to other people so they can also see our perspectives when it comes to environmental protection and, and climate change. International advocacy, that is something I believe completely that we need to, to continue using our Twitter, using our social media to, to, to be vocal about what's happening in our countries and how do we engage with other organizations in international to bring attention to our country. And, um, you know, we are on election, an election year um, in, in Jamaica and in other, in other countries of the world, in the United States. So uh, in all this COVID time, I've been thinking a lot about the concept of resilient leadership. And leadership is being, you know, are able to offer building back better. And this is a time where we, again, we need to be vocal and we need to express that this is what we require. This is what we need in moving forward because um, it's important for our generation and for the generations to come to have the right leadership uh, guiding us through, through these uh, times. Accountability and transparency are very much in line with that. So um, to, I think to almost finish, I think uh, as an, you know, Eleanor could tell you and many of you you know, if you're working in environment and or, or climate change, you are an optimist at heart. You have to be an optimist at heart, otherwise we wouldn't be able to get out of our beds in the morning. So I do believe that not all is loom and gloom. There's a lot of opportunity. 
uh, we have a window to rebuild our world and our countries in a more inclusive and more resilient and more sustainable future. We have an opportunity as individuals to act responsibly, uh, to, to bring the conversations about co uh, responsible consumption, to, to support local, to, to support our communities, to, to consume our own products, to kind of take a, an inwards approach and, and protect our own communities and, and, um, and, and try to uh, include those considerations of climate change and resiliency into our businesses and the way we do and conduct business and live our lives. Not doing so, I think it will pose a significant threat to a sustainable recovery and risk propagating future systematic shocks that we know are going to continue happening this, and on top of the climate uh, crisis. So, you know, we know about the economic diversification. That's very important. Tourism has to be diversified and our voices need to be very clear about how do we see that economic diversification happening in the tourism sector? You know, we have rich cultural, um, um, you know, uh, content and, 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 and things that, that people do not see. I, I would like to see a tourism that um, comes to Jamaica and, 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 and experiences music and, and the culture and, and, and Rastafarian culture and, um, and, and you know, comes to, to, to explore uh, the Taino, uh, uh, you know, history or our, our national herbs and our, and our wellness instead of, you know, not instead, but as, you know, in addition to resorts, that's not all we are, right? So diversification is important. Um, I'm hoping that in the in the private sector we're going to see more private public partnerships because we know that the government is not going to have the finance to to do all of what we want them to do. Private sector is going to need to start, you know, uh, you know, step up. And so we need to do a lot of awareness in the opportunities for climate uh, for private sector. And I see, you know, consultancy firms and a lot of groups, you know, emerging to help. Uh, making the case for private sector to invest in resilience, to access markets, to access concessional financing with the help of the MDVs and, and see if there are some innovative mechanisms like, you know, debt climate swaps and other financial innovations that can be done with the multilateral development banks and sectors uh, and everything to promote a low carbon economy. And to close, absolutely, we cannot leave you know we, we cannot leave anybody behind no one behind and as a society i, I like this phrase from christina figures uh, from the united nations uh, framework convention on climate change she she said as a society we're only as safe as our most vulnerable people all of us are vulnerable to virus which takes us into a space of solidarity that is exactly the thinking we need to deal with climate change we have seen the capacity of the globe and all the countries to respond to a crisis. So we know for a fact that the globe is uh, the globe. The, the world is capable of responding to climate change in a much more accelerated accelerated way. Um, COVID-19 is more than a public health crisis. It's a socioeconomic crisis and has serious repercussions for the most vulnerable members of our society, particularly those who are burdened by climate change. Um, the farmers, the, the people that have been really affected with water, with drought on top of that COVID-19 and then, you know, staying at home. Um, and, and not having the, the jobs or the opportunities for economic growth. Our vulnerable populations are at the center of the crisis. Informal workers, street vendors, women, boys, girls, persons with disabilities, elderly population, ethnic and indigenous minorities, and the LGBT community, they need to have sustained access to green jobs and health services. That is something that needs to be placed at the core and we have to advocate for that. And we can do that also by creating an, an advocating for early warning and community organization. Civil society, again, is super important grassroots engagement. I, I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm sure I, I don't need to preach because I know 
the type of advocacy that, that this group is involved in. So we just need to, you know, really need to turn it up. And, and pro the protection against gender-based violence, especially during this COVID time that people have to be, you know, locked down in houses with God knows what conditions. And then there's stigmatization in health, you know, accessing health services. So, um, and, 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 and at the top of all of this, you know, create jobs again, you know, create economic opportunities, boost entrepreneurship and be inclusive, resilient and think green when we are moving into, into the long-term recovery that we all want to see. So that's it for me. I think I, I may have taken a few, a few more minutes, but thank you. No, you're per the time I just went off. So you're good on time. Excellent. Thank you very, very much. Um, right, so... Well done, Anaiti. Well done. Very well done. <laughs> Likewise, Ambassador. <laughs> <laughs> and the floor is open. We welcome, um, you know, the broader discussion now. It, you know, what can we take away from this? What are some of the things that we need to be looking at doing? What are the concrete um, elements that we can move within you know, move forward with from within this group. So I would like to open the floor for the comments. Okay. Hi, it's Emma again. I'm going to jump in here. Hi, Anaiti. How are you? Um, Great. Thank tourism. you, Emma. <laughs> tourism. Thank you, Thank um, you for picking the eyes. Oh, yes, <laughs> um, how how do you think tourism can be diversified in a a sort of meaningful way? You mentioned indigenous um, uh, knowledge and so on. Does it all have to be done on a small local level, or do you think it can be repli replicated right across the island? I mean. Uh, I, I, you know, because we have this mass market model, which obviously is, well, in my view, I think it's unsustainable. So what are, what are your thoughts on that? No, I, I, I will think that absolutely it requires an, an innovative thinking and it has to be a program, a national program that has to be put in place so it can reach the type of scalability that, that you know, people may deem you know, important and, and, and critical in when it comes to diversifying. Again, we cannot do like the silo approach of, okay, we're going to do this little thing in Portland while the rest of the, of, the, of the island is not doing that. And then we're doing this little thing in St. Thomas or this little thing in St. Mary. No, it has to be really a national program. And yeah. that national program requires, you know, uh, requires putting pressure on the Ministry of Tourism requires putting pressure because they have the capacity. They are the agency that are supposed to be doing this, this right? So we have to put pressure and say, all right, where is this happening? How, is, how are you thinking about the diversification of, of the tourism? Um, and and they, I, I do think that there is opportunity to, to create these kind of programs. And I would take the same approach, for example, when it comes to drought. How is it that, that we don't have a national flooding program or a national drought management program or you know everything has to be at that scale or a, or a national you know solar energy program you know um so so i, I do i do think i do think that it's it's doable I, it requires again political will and and the you know the innovation thinking in how to put it you know to to turn the wheels into that. And it's not one thing replacing the other. It's in addition, we have to add right now, just as the, the you know, we personally, at least myself, I'm thinking, oh, all right, I have to have job A, B, C, and D, because now is how, how you need to move around. The same approach is for national, you know, we have to have, all right, a resource, but we have to have music and we have to have this, and we have to have national heritage and we have to have, you know, a wellness tourism. It's, it's a program. Thanks, Anaiti. Uh, we actually have questions from Judith Wedderburn and I see Lynette Vassler as well. So ladies, Judith, can you? Um, you, also have, you also have Beverly Mullings, I see your hand up. Okay. And 
Hillary easy. Nichols not had her hand up from before too. Okay, so I'm somehow not seeing right. it. Thank you, thank you, Indy. Yes. Go ahead, Judy. Are you hearing me? In um, okay. Thank you so much, panelists. I just have a question. Um, on the slide, this is for Anna T. On your slide that spoke about aligned recovery plans with national climate targets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, a very important one. And I'm so happy me what that you meant by who, whose recovery plans? Because, I mean, there are a few of us that are being keen to trying to keep track of the government's overall task force recovery program mm -hmm. and it it, it 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 seems to me while we have to we live in a market oriented economy we have all of these targets to meet under our macroeconomic program so for me is where do we find the space to say to the planners at that high level look none of those national recovery programs are going to make sense long term without the, without simultaneously working towards our national climate targets to recover that part of our ecosystem that have been so badly damaged over time because those are the parts which large chunks of our economic recovery require whether it's agriculture or whatever and in the midst of all of that there are the issues that are related to the crises in public health and you are right it's not just a crisis in public health it's a crisis in social and economic so i mm -hmm. i am I'm, I'm looking for ways to connect those dots because it's not either or you're right but i kind of feel like the, the economic recovery part is running ahead without um, yeah. You're not absolutely not absolutely if i can just throw in here just yes. to support the point that judith has made and um and i you will you will elaborate on it but that's one of the inadequacies if you will that 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 i mentioned that so we we're doing the recovery but we're not taking the environmental considerations into account which which include very importantly the climate targets and it's not going to be sustainable unless we do that back to you and it no and I'm, I'm so happy judith that you picked that up because that is a very important uh, aspect of this and and I'm, I'm going to to talk a little bit on my personal experience working with the climate change division i i think i, I see some uh, some of my colleagues connected so if they want to to jump in please so I, I'm going to be very honest with you. It has been a little bit frustrating that in the in the in the creation of this economic task task force, climate change was not a thought uh, at the beginning. You know, maybe, and I'm 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 hoping that people that are working within that task force are have you know the 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 interest and and I have some some kind of thinking around climate change and resiliency, hoping, right? But I was hoping that that climate change will be something more mainstream into the task force. It wasn't, but that is fine. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, um, it, this is a continuous process. And, and I had to, to, to come into terms with that at some point, that um, <clears throat> when it was created, I remember when it was announced, I was looking into the list to see, all right, climate change, where, where are the environmentalists? Where? And I didn't see that many people. I, I know people that are very you know, uh, cognizant of the problems, but I didn't see it so, so defined. So then, um, working with the with the director of the division, uh, climate change division, Yuna May Gordon, who's a fantastic, you know, person and, and a leader, she she said, "All right, if 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 it is if it is that that we cannot be so actively involved in this task force, let let us think what's going to be the process of this task force. Let's let's say for let's take for a minute, how is this going to be operationalized?" They are going to come up with a set of recommendations, and I'm assuming here, if somebody has a better answer, please, by, by all means. 
uh, if, if they're gonna come up with a set of, we're thinking, assuming that these people that were part of these subcommittees went into each of the sectors, took information from the Planning Institute of Jamaica, from the, the economy, and it started to assess where are the loopholes or where are the hotspots or where could be the opportunities, right? I would think that was the process. And then once they come up with this set of recommendations, I don't think the task force is a task force that should be, you know, permanent. It's, it's a short thing, you know, it's a short task force. It's, it's just to, to kickstart, to, to kickstart a process. So once they have this set of recommendations, we were thinking, okay, they need to, it's, it's up to the, to the Ministry of Finance and up to, to the PM, to the Prime Minister and the Planning Institute of Jamaica to come on board and, and start, you know, uh, fleshing out how these recommendations can possibly play out and be implemented effectively in the country. And that's when, when we also saw uh, an, an entry point with the Planning Institute of Jamaica. And, and the Climate Change Division has been a, a really active, has taken an active role in engaging with the international community to embed an economic advisor at the Planning Institute of Jamaica to help um, assess the recommendations that are come, gonna come out from the task force and help conduct that exercise of aligning with the National Development Plan and our updated climate targets, which are recently updated. We are, we, uh, Jamaica didn't, didn't drop the ball on that one. The climate targets are on time, are delivered and assessed, are updated and they're ready right now. So, so we have seen uh, an entry point with the Planning Institute of Jamaica to conduct that sort of exercise. This is not something that is short term, this is going to be a continuous process and hopefully uh, with the leadership and the, and the initiative of the Planning Institute of Jamaica and their capacity to coordinate among sectors, we will see how those recommendations can be further fleshed out. So it generates the type of, of green growth that we will want to see. Um, thanks, Anaiti. Um, I would like to, Judith, I'm not, are you okay with that in terms of their clarity for your, your question? Not really, but let's, no. let's move along. Okay. I, I will keep listening. I mean, parts of it were addressed, but that's okay. It's a process, so let's keep going mm -hmm. and I can re-enter later on, but give some other folks a chance now. Right, so in the interest of time, I would like to ask Hillary, Lynette, and Beverly to just pose their questions and then we can, um, Eleanor and Anete can respond. So ladies, uh, Hillary, do you still have your question? Is Hillary there? Okay, all right. If Hillary is not coming on, um, Lynette, could you pose your questions, please? Thank you, Indy. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, panelists. I have two questions for the two panelists. Both of you have spoken about the fact that community-driven solutions is the way forward in addressing sustainable development and environmental, um, addressing environmental issues within a sustainable framework. W what kind of governance framework and leadership framework is needed to really drive that community-driven approach. Mindful that Indy is looking for real solutions moving forward. And the second question is this, that the high debt is identified as one of the jeopardies that we face. Are there, in your view, prospects for international advocacy for debt relief and debt rescheduling by the Jamaica, Jamaican authorities. 
Amen. Amen. It is a desirable goal. Eleanor, okay. uh, Eleanor or Emma, if you guys want to take <laughs> on community driven, I can take on the, the, the international. Economy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, the the community community framework. I don't I don't know, um, Lynette, if I can really speak to how we we might set up a framework for that. You you are probably best positioned to do that. But but we have to we have to work with our our community groups um, on a practical level and and working with people who really understand what is what is happening there. How it will be financed is, a, is another matter. Um, but we know that if we really want to, to bring about change, and, and when we're talking about community and sustainable development and environment, we're talking about practical things, you know, like um, how we manage water, yes. how we manage waste, how we protect ourselves against the vector-borne diseases, um, and, and how, how what, what are the groups that we can we can work. We can work through. We have to, and and we shouldn't be reinventing the wheel because there are many, many um, entities that have been doing some of this. And but as as we all know, especially if you're dealing with civil society, it depends on who the leadership is at a particular time and the energy and and so on. But we have to go back and 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 I think revisit uh, some of those and and try to 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 craft it into into practical things because again when you're working with community groups you sometimes feel like you are on a treadmill because you work with the group things are improved people move on and then you still have the same issues which means that the sustainability issue isn't there so we, we have to, to to perhaps look at how we how we might how we might do that and and again going back to public private um, linkages and the corporate social responsibility we, we see all these corporate hands so to speak handing out things but it, it 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 should be more than that because there are some private entities private companies that have good um community linkages and and doing work like that so i i think that that might be one one way looking at the, the private um public partnership with civil society not public private civil society um linkages for for getting some of these things done yes and um i agree with everything eleanor says but I, I i don't know if this is at all possible or has been done at some point but um how about some kind of formal uh network of community based groups with you know, very much the same focus because we do see, as Eleanor just said, that there are specific, very practical issues that um, that uh, groups that these groups are focused on in their communities, and water being a big one, of course. Um, but I'm wondering if there's some kind of network that could be set up that would not only share information but also, um, in terms of capacity building, bringing these groups together, um, maybe in one place or when COVID is over and we can all go <laughs> offline again. But um, if there's that possibility to, to just um, strengthen all these groups so they could learn from each other, because we find that they're doing their, their little thing in one corner of the island and they don't know that someone might be trying to do the same thing over the other side of the island. So I don't know if there's some kind of community-based sustainability, environmental, whatever you like to call it, network um, that, could, um, that could gradually build up that would be a sort of like a self-support. And obviously the private sector support is also incredibly important. And I think there could be um, a better way of structuring that finance as well. Um, Emma, let me just make a quick comment before Anate, you respond and then we take Beverly and close because the time is basically up. But I wanted also to share on the community governance side, another project that I'm working with, um, the Community Disaster Risk Reduction Fund out of the Caribbean Development Bank has been doing um, 
quite a bit of work with communities and climate change. Uh, they, they have eight projects in four countries, Jamaica, um, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, BVI, and Belize. And part of the approach that has been taken for that is a lot of community mobilization um, and also putting in um, tools and structures so they have a, a livelihood baseline assessment that takes into consideration climate change and disaster risk reduction. So getting from the communities some of the livelihoods that are impacted by climate change and disasters and options for transitioning whether from some of the traditional livelihoods to more dynamic ones. And also um, they've worked with implementing enhanced country poverty assessments which takes in the, the, some of the vulnerable groups. So some of the research and the, active, and the work on the ground has been incorporated at the government level as part of the partnership. Um, so they are doing quite a bit too and putting the communities um, in, in touch with other funders. So the GEF, um, the CRIF and so on that can continue to fund some of the work when the community, um, the CDRF projects finishes. So that is one model of something that's been both national and um, regional at the same time, you know, that we can look at to, to continue some of the work. So Anate, can you respond with the debt relief? And then I'll ask Beverly to give us the final question. Yes, um, I definitely, um, the, there is no way to recover from COVID-19 without falling into public debt. And that is a reality that, that is gonna happen. All of the countries are gonna go through it. It can be between 1% to 4% of the GDP. So it's gonna slow down a lot of things. Like I was saying at the beginning, it's going to affect the capacity of the government to, to respond to other social and economic needs for sure. Um, I have seen uh, some some response from the International Monetary uh, Monetary Fund on on debt debt relief, but mostly looking into flexible repayment uh, that Jamaica has taken on. Uh, so Jamaica is one of the beneficiaries to to let's say debt relief, quote unquote, right? Because there is there's, they're not saying don't pay; they're just saying you have a little more time to pay. Um, and then I do believe, and I would like to see, and, and I, don't, I don't have the answer to that, but I would, I, I would like to see CARICOM uh, taking a more coordinated approach into, into presenting, uh, 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 I would say, a, a, a debt recovery a strategy for the region. That I haven't seen. I, I believe that the leadership that we have in, in, in the Barbados Prime Minister, Mia Motley, it's, it's very interesting and, and important. And us as, as advocates in our own you know, sectors, we need to amplify her voice because we have access to, to other international agencies that you know, need to, to hear what she has to say. And I think what she's been doing, she has been doing is very interesting. I, I would like to see something like that, that and, and a, strat, a strategic and coordinated approach from the region. People always, always will jump and say, yes, but we're different, different islands. Absolutely, I agree. Different islands, different situations. But I think when it comes to debt relief, we are on the same boat, in the exact same boat. And if, you know, knocking, my, my, uh, knocking on wood, but we get hit by a hurricane tomorrow, or any or, or our neighbors are hit by a hurricane tomorrow on top of COVID-19, it's just debt after debt and a, and a never ending uh, cycle, vicious cycle. So, so I do believe there, there should be more, uh, more initiatives or more push into a strategic regional approach for debt, for debt relief. So at the end of the day, that means that we at our levels need to be up, need to advocate and be vocal about it and demand it as citizens. Uh, thank you, Anate. Um, Beverly, can you pose your question and then we close with remarks from the two presenters? Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. And it's been lovely um, sitting here. I'm, I'm 
tapping in from Canada. So I'm sort of on the outside looking in. Um, I think part of one of the questions I wanted to ask has already been answered, but I wanted to put it just in context. What I was struck by is that everything that was said were really interesting, doable, agreeable, you know, um, suggestions, um, proposals, but that's sitting on top of about, what, 40 years of market logics that has actually embraced only the market and not necessarily the most vulnerable in looking for solutions. So I was, my, I had two questions to ask. It seemed to me that to, to do any of the things that you have advocated, we need to talk about debt, which you just did, and to talk about finance, and actually to talk about the role of trade and trade rules. So, you know, the COVID moment has made it possible for us to think about things we could never have thought of before. On, on my side where I am here, to even hear people talk about prison abolition, defunding the police. I mean, who would ever think that we could live in a world where these things were possible? And so it seems to me that the COVID moment also makes it possible to think about um, some of those things, debt relief, finance, to rethink how that gets done, and in terms of trade rules. So my question now, I'm gonna change it a little bit because you did answer some of it. My question was, is there a role for the region and I think you've adequately Anity, answered that. But is there a role for a diaspora? Because it seems to me that we need a lot of advocacy on those fronts and they don't always come up. And I, I, you know, sometimes diaspora can be a problematic space in itself, but this is a space for putting pressure and, and thinking about the vulnerable. And I just am curious about what you think about that. Thanks. Um, and I tell Eleanor if you can answer her, but also make closing comments as well, please. Okay, I, I, I think the, the role of the diaspora is a key one, but as, as you say, that can be problematic. So, but we don't dismiss that. We, we, we try to look for the targets and, and if, if we are looking for specific things, then we, we approach. There is definitely a role for diaspora has so much wealth. Um, and I'm not talking about financial wealth. I'm talking about um, the, 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 the way our people are positioned, the influence, the advocacy. There are lots, lots that we can tap into there. So yes, by all means. And um, just before I hand over to, to Anaiti, I wanted to take the opportunity just to say, while we're talking about this, we're talking about um, vulnerable groups, we also need to talk about the involvement of youth. And one of the things that I, I wanted to put in a plug for is the Jamaica Climate Change Youth Council, which is um, affiliated with the, with the National Climate Change Advisory Board. And they have been doing a number of sensitization sessions. And post-COVID, they have started a series of same kind of conversations and dialogue reaching out. And, and they have looked at the po a post-COVID Earth. They have looked at the question of whether the Earth is better off without us, and and then and the, the last one and the one to come is dealing with food security. So we have different groups. We are talking about how to get community involved and, and to get the young people involved. I think is very very important. So we're talking about the young people. We're talking about diaspora. We're talking about private sector, civil society relationships, and 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 healing. And, and what and I to call the resilient leadership, which, which I liked, and, and the whole business of, 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 of healing. And, and was it, I don't know whether it was Anaiji or Carol who's talked about the positive mental space, which we, which we need to, to advocate for. So those would be my final remarks, Lindy. Over to you, Anaiji. Well, um, Eleanor, always difficult to come after you. <laughs> But uh, I think the only thing I will add when it comes to the diaspora is that um, there, has, there are a couple of initiatives um, that are emerging on, the, on capturing donations from the diaspora to reallocate to social projects or to economic projects. I, I know, and this is you know, a little bit of an, an advertising here. It's a very good friend of mine, Melissa Wallace has recently um, launched Citizens for Citizens um, Fund. Um, so it's a, a, a private led uh, or you know, organized fund 
that is you know has a has a has a has a board and a, and, a, and an assessment and due diligence and they have set up a structure to capture donations from the diaspora so if the diaspora wants to you know reallocate philanthropy or donate or participate in local projects those kind of structures i think are emerging and and could be a good avenue for the for the diaspora to participate locally. Um, yeah, that's that's what I can think of, of of the diaspora in addition to what Eleanor already. Um, Eleanor, thanks, thanks, Anete. Eleanor, there was one one question about contact information for the youth council. So maybe if you could respond in the chat to that question. Um, yes. You know that would yes. be helpful. Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> I just want to summarize and thank everybody for the extra time because we have run a bit over the time. Um, but I, I think I reached this question. I, I, I want to challenge us to think for our takeaways, what are we moving from here with? What are we going to be lobbying for? What are the concrete things that can be implemented? What are the things that, um, you know, we didn't get to touch on much. We could have spent a bit more time on the livelihoods um, in, a, in a concrete way. Um, but also, I wanted to just highlight the issue of climate finance as something that we lobby for a bit more because we need to ensure that there are funds available for persons on the ground, farmers and so on, to do concrete to build resilience at the, the ground the ground level and so so seeing initiatives like the um jane climate smart loan more of that for persons to access something we can think about because that can help to really boost livelihoods as well um i think i will just leave it there at this point we will be sharing the the recording from the webinar um with the the participants and thank you very much for your time feel free to contact any of us um for follow-up discussions thank you very much everybody thank you everyone have a good rest of your friday <laughs> thank you Bye. have a good weekend and i'm i'm just getting the contact information which i will, will i will put here so have a good weekend and thank a safe you, one Connell. wonderful work Bye. Bye. Take care. Thank you all. Thank you. Really. Thank you very much, ladies. Good Thank job. You. Good job, Indy. <laughs> Thank to you. See you. I, yes. I, I can only see you online. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a past diamond.